Okay, hello everybody. Uh, welcome back to TWIG. TWIG stands for This Week in Global Health. This is your one-stop shop for all the good, the bad, and the ugly in the world of global health. This week we're going to be doing some news roundup. So we're just looking at, at, at recent events in the global health space, what's been in the news, um, and just a quick shout out to, to uh, the Global Health Now newsletter. We've been getting that. We read it. It's fantastic. Johns Hopkins University put it out there. So if you're wanting a good kind of uh, something to read on a regular basis, this is about what's happening in the global health space. Highly recommended. I'm going to start with Christy. Christy, tell us who you are, where you are, what are you going to talk about. Actually, I'm going to start with me. I'm Greg Martin, <laughs> and I'm going to be talking to you about a <laughs> health worker strike uh, in Liberia. These are the health workers working on the Ebola front line. Next up, Christy, <laughs> who are you and what are you going to talk about today? I am okay. Chris Ronson. I'm coming to you from San Francisco, California. And today I'm going to be covering uh, some progress being made in uh, press control of drugs in Uganda as well as a little bit of post coverage of the Johns Hopkins uh, Ebola Summit. I'm sorry, okay, Ebola great. Forum. <laughs> Thanks, Christy. Next up, Jessica. Jessica, where are you? What are you going to talk about today? Hey everyone, I'm Jessica Taff and I'm coming to you from the Washington DC metro area. Today I'm going to tell you about the Nobel Peace Prize that was won for promoting girls' education around the world and why this is a win also for global health. Okay, thanks very much. And we've got a new member on the team, Sulzan. Sulzan, can you talk to us? Where are you? What are you going to talk to us, to us about today? Hi, I'm Sulzan Bali and I'm speaking to you from Durham, North Carolina. I'll be telling you about the recent dengue outbreak in, which has hit southern China and southern countries in the Western Pacific region. Um, later on, I will also be talking about the Global Hunger Index report which has recently been released and its findings. Okay, very good. So just a quick reminder, of course the show is going out live on the internet, so if you're watching this live, please tweet us, use the hashtag TWIG, T-W-I-G-H, that stands for This Week in Global Health. Use that hashtag, and we will be responding to questions and comments at the end of the show from anyone that's watching this live. Um, and, of course, during the week, you can also hashtag us, and, and you can email us at hello at twig.org. We've got a web page, uh, www.twig.org. And, um, of course, we've got the show notes, right? So if, if you want to get the show notes of these shows and get all the links and the URLs to any of the web pages that we make reference to during the show, then subscribe to our show notes. You can, you can subscribe at the web page, uh, and you'll get that sent as an email. You'll get it in your inbox. Right. Let's jump right in. Jessica, talk to us about the Nobel Prize. Excellent. Thanks, Greg. Okay, so last week, Malawa Yousafzai won the Nobel Peace Prize for her heroic advocacy efforts promoting education for girls around the world. Now, those of you that don't know about Malawa, and you should because she's fantastic, Malawa was 11 years old when she became an outspoken blogger uh, for the BBC against the Taliban for, what, for their efforts to ban education for girls in Pakistan. Now, this is horrible, right? I mean, how could you... How could you want to ban education for girls in Pakistan? But apparently the Taliban were completely against this, and they stormed her school bus, and they shot her in the head. Now, but this is great because she recovered with renewed vigor in her advocacy efforts and has been continued to be an outspoken person um, and advocate for girls' education, which then led her to be winning the Nobel Peace Prize for these efforts. Wow, amazing. And you know, they say that if you educate a man, you educate a person. If you educate a woman, you educate a family. I mean, you know... Uh, Jessica, could you just talk to us a little bit about what the health implications of that of education for women are? Absolutely, and there's so many of them. I mean, I think for a lot of people, they may not see the connection to education for health, and it's particularly, like you said, women's education or girls' education because they're going to be coming women, and women are very central to health, um, and, but, and it starts with their education. For instance, education, and particularly girls' education, is related to fertility. Um, Educating a girl helps women control how many children they have, and increasing girls' participation in school over time decreases family sizes. For instance, in Mali, women with secondary education or higher have an average of three children, while those that don't have have an average of seven children. So that's, that's a really interesting statistic. Okay. Uh, also, um, you can talk about maternal health. Increasing girls' access to education improves maternal health. It also improves child survival. If, for instance, uh, a child that's born to a mother who can read is 50% more likely to survive past the age of five than a child that's born to an illiterate woman. Education also can, in fact, can also affect how um, 
infectious diseases. For instance, education decreases a woman or a girl's risk for contracting HIV or transmitting HIV to her baby. And finally, education can relate to the income potential of a woman. For instance, education boosts a woman's earning power, which in the long term what makes her a functioning uh, economic member of society which then can lead to a more developed society and a more healthier society. Okay, very interesting stuff. Okay, now I'm going to give you a little factoid about the Nobel Prize and I'm going to keep this very brief. I've, you know, I've been told not to waffle on it. Uh, the Nobel, the origins of the Nobel Prize have a slightly sinister, it has got a bit of a sinister beginning. Alfred Nobel actually invented dynamite which at the time was being used for more than just mining, but it was actually being used as a weapon. Now, why did he start the Nobel Prize? His brother Ludwig actually died, and a reporter incorrectly thought that it was Alfred Nobel that had died and published his obituary. Well, his obituary said something along the lines of, oh my God, thank God this guy has died. He made all of his millions through human misery. You know, sing hallelujah, we've, you know, we've killed the beast. And, uh, and Alfred Nobel read his own obituary and realized that actually he would be remembered as this terrible person, took his millions and started the Nobel Prize. Okay, <laughs> say anything more about that. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about, in Liberia, uh, healthcare workers have, stri they've been threatening to, and some of them have actually stopped working. These are the healthcare workers dealing with the Ebola virus epidemic, really at the front line. And their reasoning is that they, they've not been paid. And uh, some, t some of them have been paid, but significantly less than what, they've be what, what was agreed. And these, they're really not making much money. They're making between $300 and $500 a month. Now, they, they, they haven't been paid. They've stopped working. And, and in terms of a threat to you know, this ongoing epidemic, that is significant. Um, USAID in September did go into an agreement with the Liberian government. They set aside $5 million to help pay healthcare workers. But they didn't give that money to the Liberian government. Instead, they set it aside to reimburse the government once they had paid the healthcare workers. And so that money hasn't been dispersed and the workers haven't been paid. I don't know how to sort this mess out, but all, like our message to the Liberian government and to USAID is sort this out, fix it. These people have to be paid. Uh, the work they're doing is incredibly important. They put it their lives at risk. There's already been 201 healthcare workers dying of the Ebola virus epidemic, and there will be more. So these these are really the, the, you know at the front line you know of the Ebola virus epidemic. Um, also in the news, we don't have it as a, a news item that we're going to talk about a lot because I'm sure everybody's aware of it. But there's been a, a second healthcare worker in Texas that's contracted HIV, uh, HIV contracted Ebola virus. Uh, obviously, that's a terrible thing that's happened. I think what it highlights to us is just how contagious this virus is. And if in a place like Texas, where these healthcare workers have got access to the best possible uh, you know, uh, infectious control facilities, if, if one patient has given it to two healthcare workers, how much more are these healthcare workers at the front line in places like L Liberia? They're not even in tertiary hospitals half the time. They're working in little clinics in the middle of nowhere. Sometimes they struggle to even have access to gloves. How much more are they at risk of contracting uh, the Ebola virus, and, and it's, you know, I mean, the whole situation is absolutely terrible. Um, I'm not going to carry on about that now. I know everybody's reading about Ebola, and everybody's kind of up to date. In fact, most of you watching this probably know more about it than me at this point. Um, oh, wait, great. Can I interject with something really quickly? Yes. I know that the whole situation in Dallas has been very prevalent, especially here in the U.S., on the news. Um, it is a big issue, but I just want to go back and really quickly put this in context in the terms of what Greg was talking about with the Liberian healthcare workers. We have two people who have come down with Ebola in the United States. Liberia, as of this, uh, I'm sorry, as of October 10th, in the Ministry of Health Situation Report, has requested 80,000 more body bags. So, what wow. we do have to focus on is that we do have the infrastructure to help contain and man maintain health in this country. Uh, places like Liberia don't have that at all. So yeah, just Chris, to... thanks, thanks for bringing it up. I think that, that's a staggering number. I mean, I hadn't heard that, and it really puts it into perspective. And I'm glad you mentioned it because, you know, here you and I and Sulzan are in the states. I don't know how much Greg has been catching up with the panic that's going on in the states, but there's been so much attention of it here. And I think it's detracting for from what's going on in West Africa, which that that can happen because if we're ever going to get in control of this epidemic, we need to get in control in West Africa and not focus on it here. I mean, obviously we need to think about it here, but putting all the panic energy here is not going to get the job done in West Africa. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. And then totally one, one additional note, though, there was something during the uh, Johns Hopkins um, 
the Ebola conference that we're going to go over a little bit later, somebody actually mentioned as well, one of the presenters, that hopefully by December they're going to come out with uh, two clinical trials for vaccines in Liberia. So we can, we can look for that. Vaccines are probably going to be the answer to sort of squelching this pandemic, but uh, West Africa is definitely not doing as well as we could ever as we could ever do with our infrastructure and our public health system. So no, absolutely, and even if we had a vaccine, rolling a vaccine out is going to take forever. I mean, this absolutely. this epidemic is far from over. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in um, terms of, um, Greg, uh, being on the same point as Ebola, um, I mean, I recently uh, read that actually WHO has said that if the outbreak in West Africa is not controlled within the next three months, we might start seeing up to 10,000 cases per week. So uh, it, yeah. it, is, uh, it is amazing the amount of impact. And this is the first time Ebola outbreak has reached uh, an urban city when it uh, reached uh, Lagos. Um, yeah, so I totally agree with Jessica and uh, Chris on that, that the outbreak needs to be controlled in West Africa. Yeah, absolutely. OK, we're going to move on. Uh, Sultan is going to talk to us about dengue. Now, I've always called it dengue virus. But it's dengue, I'm told. Although there's a little bit of controversy around this, I Thank believe that you. people. Where in the world did you hear <laughs> that? Thing? I'm taking your doctor. You're getting your 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 medical license taken away for saying dengue. I get hand back my medical degree. Although, although <laughs> in, India, uh, in India, we call it uh, dengue as well. <laughs> okay, and India have got a billion people, so I'm siding with a billion people here. And China <laughs> might be the same. I'm actually. You know what I mean? It's, 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 it's the rest of the world against the two of you. Um, <laughs> All okay. right, well, this is where we bring in our Twitter community and say, or anyone listening, you can email us or tweet us right now and settle this controversy right here. Tell us if you call it dengu or dengue. Okay, we'll get, it, we'll get a poll going, and I suppose it all comes down tomato, to... Tomato, 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 tomato. Know, pr presumably, it's named after the place at which it was originally diagnosed. And we should find out how the people that live in Are the rest uh, of us here? Oh, yeah. we lost Greg. <laughs> we lost Greg. We lost our host. Um, well, that's because he said dengue. <laughs> All right, well then let's, let's move on. Let's move on to the, the dengue. Universe, the yeah, universe the dengue. decided it. Staying on the point of uh, dengue or dengue, uh, as you prefer, southern China and western Pacific region has been hit by the worst dengue outbreak seen in decades. Um, as of 11th October uh, 2014, dengue has infected over 31,000 people in southern China. Um, in fact, the capital of uh, Guangdong province, uh, also famous for SARS, um, at the time of the SARS outbreak, uh, the capital, Guangzhou, has been struck by the outbreak particularly hard with over 25,000 people uh, infected in Guangzhou alone. Um, the other provinces include Zhejiang, Fujian, Yunnan, and Guangxi, which have been uh, affected by the outbreak. The incidence rate of dengue uh, is over 1,000 infections per day in China at the moment, and only recently, uh, as of uh, this weekend, dropped to 910 infections. Wow. Sultan, I'm really glad that you brought this topic up because dengue ha is one of my pet topics, and um, like I've been in very much interested in what's going on with the Ebola thing. There's just so much panic, but I don't know if many people know that dengue is, is um, in some parts of the United States, and there's a great fear of mosquito-borne infections like dengue and chikungunya, another very similar related virus, to mm -hmm. become endemic here. And like those numbers that you're talking about, I mean, if you think about how they compare with the Ebola, maybe it's not going to be killing as many people, but severe dengue is no joke. So um, yeah. I'm really glad that you bring that and bring it to people's attention. Yeah, mm -hmm. in fact, uh, like, thank, thanks for saying that, because uh, I think Ebola has uh, deflected the attention from dengue, which uh, a lot of countries have been seeing dengue outbreak particularly badly this year. Um, Japan, in fact, uh, in uh, the end of August, uh, saw... They have a new, new, new transmission, right? Or, or no, re-imported or something like that. They hadn't seen transmission for a while. I remember reading about that. Yeah, yeah, like over 70 years. And, uh, Crazy. Hello? Oh, there we go. <laughs> I think we we're just back. We're just having this all of how you guys know we're live because we have yeah, technical. This, this is definitely live. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, Chris, you you are going to yeah. talk about something, right? 
I was. In keeping with, we were just talking about sort of mosquito vector-borne diseases, um, I wanted to do a little bit of coverage of some progress that's been made uh, in Uganda, where the government is actually going to be doing some uh, price control of malaria and diarrheal drugs in an effort to ensure fair pricing and control the distribution of drugs, including counterfeit drugs, uh, and, and to circumvent potential drug resistance issues. They've introduced an accreditation system for importers, retailers, and wholesalers of essential malaria and diarrheal drugs to ensure that they sell uh, that those people sell genuine and fairly priced drugs. Uh, it's a result of a system or a two-year consultative program developed between the government, the aforementioned importers, retailers, wholesalers, and consumers of the drugs to identify sources as well as to determine why there has been some drug resistance on the market as of late, uh, as well as looking out again for counterfeit drugs, which in all areas of the world is a huge issue. All importers of the drugs will be required to get accreditation from the Ministry of Health, as well as import drugs only from manufacturers endorsed by the World Health Organization so as to understand uh, and better identify where counterfeit drugs are coming from. Uh, for those of you who don't know, malaria and diarrhea are the two leading causes of death in Uganda, and this intervention helps ensure access uh, of the necessary drugs to the communities who really need them the most. Mr. Samuel Opio, the secretary of the Uganda Council of the Pharmaceutical Society, stated that retailers will be required to sell the drugs at agreed prices, which are close to 65 to 85 percent lower than usual. Uh, and it is important to add that access to these drugs in public facilities will remain free to Ugandans. That's really interesting, Chris, that you talk about these things. I mean, I would love to hear from our community, if anyone's listening, that's, talks, that's uh, involved in kind of the um, access to essential medicines community or mm -hmm. patent law or those sorts of things. I'm curious how this will affect kind of those initiatives, whether it's for or against. I mean, it seems like a really good initiative to, to address something that's really important and, and the use of counterfeit drugs, which can lead to drug resistance. Um, but I also, I guess I'm sort of curious, I mean, how does this deal with the overall global market for these drugs and um, the pricing of them and those sort of things. Yeah. Well, in addition, I mean, we were just talking about um, everything that's been happening with Chungaya and with a number of other issues, the dengue. Um, those are also neglected diseases, neglected tropical diseases or just otherwise neglected diseases. And so it would be interesting to see also now that Ebola is front and center and that's something that no one ever really considered a threat. Um, as far as coming to our country, how the attention switches onto these um, until now neglected diseases and treatment. Because malaria certainly isn't, it's a huge issue, it's, it's a massive issue, but it isn't something that has gone unaddressed uh, from the global health community. So I'm sort of excited to see how things turn as far as like the neglected diseases initiatives. Okay, look, I'm we back, have Greg. Hey, Am Greg. I back? Can you hear me? <laughs> Yeah, okay, yeah I, had, hear you. I had technical issues. Uh, I suddenly got a message saying that I had no internet connection, so I've had to technical. move. Technical. I yeah. think that was the universe <laughs> winning on our side saying, no, dengue, mm -mm. <laughs> <laughs> You think it was a sign? Uh, I, no, do. I, I, I do. I suddenly lost internet connection, so I've moved to a different part of my house where I've got better Wi-Fi. Okay. So, I'm back. so we've been talking about... Dengue, dengue, uh, what, and we, dengue we, we did malaria and diarrheal drugs, and now we're back into Sulzan for some uh, interesting information that she has about India and the Global Hunger Index. Oh, good. Well, I had things to say about dengue. Oh, no, no you can, oh, yeah, yeah, you can okay. definitely go on and talk about dengue, Greg, if you want. 